Inspirational Creatives, Episode 1. Welcome to Inspirational Creatives. I'm your host, Rob Lawrence. Join me every Friday as I chat with successful artists, producers, and creative entrepreneurs who share powerful stories and strategies. They can help you to create the life that you want. Listen each week as these inspirational creatives show you how to take your creativity to the next level. You'll learn how to create a sustainable business that inspires others and gives you the financial freedom and lifestyle that you want. Thanks for listening. Make sure you subscribe in iTunes and sign up at inspirationalcreatives.com to get free exclusive bonus material. And now on with the show. Before we begin today's episode, I just want to say a massive thanks to Jana Schubert. It was Jana's inspiration and action that created an event earlier this year that brought together an inspirational group of forward thinkers from across Europe and North America. Without that event alive in Berlin, this podcast series would not have the potential and some of the inspirational guests that it has today. Jana, thank you and back to the show. Rob Lawrence here and welcome to the very first episode of Inspirational Creatives. In this episode, I'm extremely excited and delighted to introduce to you the inspirational Greg Hartle. Greg has run and built many multi-million dollar businesses and is well known for having made $10 million from just $10 and a laptop. In his 16-year career, he has been a founder, partner and board member, having played a significant role in many successful businesses that support entrepreneurs, startups and corporate groups across the United States. I got to meet Greg in Berlin earlier this year and I was deeply moved and challenged by his presentation, which talked a lot about death. What challenged me the most was the thought that one of the reasons we might be afraid of death is that we're too scared to be fully alive whilst we are living. So today, it gives me great pleasure to talk with Greg Hartle. Greg, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate being here and I, it's exciting to be on the first episode. Yeah, great. Thank you. Is there anything you'd like to add to that introduction to help gain a sense of who you are? Uh, I think it will unfold in the conversation. I think what you said there was uh, you know, an accurate uh, history of my, my career over the last 16 years. It's been an interesting ride and um, I would say that uh, what I'm most curious about with you is talking about this idea of creativity because you mentioned uh, me being as somebody who is creative and I would not consider myself as such or didn't for a long time. So I'm happy to have that conversation. That's great. Well, let's start there then. In your view, what does living a creative life mean to you? Well, what's interesting about that is, you know, I used to think that, you know, at the beginning when I would think of creativity, I would think in large part of people who were just quote unquote, naturally creative. So that would be, say, a musician or um, an artist of some sort. Uh, And then there's the creative endeavors, you know, anything from scrapbooking to, um, you know, any sort of like painting or something like that. I'm a, you know, significant analytical type person. And so I would not default to that level of creativity naturally. However, what I've come to learn over the course of time is that creativity is more about problem solving and more about connecting dots. So when looked at from that perspective, I I guess in many ways I'm actually quite creative in that I enjoy the process of solving problems and I enjoy the process of building businesses or, or developing products or whatever it might be that solve those problems. And typically my solutions are the result of me just simply connecting a bunch of dots that otherwise might seem like disparate dots that don't have any sort of connection to them. And uh, in, in the process of doing that have come up with, you know, different creative solutions for different problems. And in that regard, then I would consider myself to be a creative person. And so for me, when you ask, you know, what is a creative person or what is a creative life? To me, it's really about curiosity and exploration and problem solving. And so if, if it, it, and, and that might be solving your own problems through your own art or music, um, you know, working out some of your own angst or anxieties or stresses. Um, it might be solving problems for other people when you see other people struggling with things and you might have an idea that, that might help them get through that or live a better life or a more well-rounded life or, uh, you know, have better well-being. So for me, it's, it's really in large part about just being curious about the world around you, being curious about how things work or don't work, and, and then uh, looking at uh, problems through a solution lens, you know, what, what are possible solutions to this? 
and taking uh, taking action on that. That's such an inspiring answer you've given me there because I very much see entrepreneurs as inherently creative. And I guess that as beings, curious beings, we're inherently creative. So in many mm-hmm. respects, something I see from the outside looking in at other entrepreneurs is this innate ability to be able to connect two unassuming dots and create something yes. that hasn't otherwise existed in, in the world before. You mentioned curiosity just now, and children are clearly creative beings. I'd like to ask you, if I may, what was Greg like as a child? <laughs> uh, very different than Greg is like as an adult, I can tell you that. <laughs> um, you, you know, I've always been an ambitious person, that's for sure. And I've always been, uh, I, I would say that in some ways I have been a natural leader in that people tend to gravitate toward me. And I think that's largely in part because I have a certain level of calmness about me and always have. And yet I'm also very, as a child, I was also very active. So, um, you know, I played sports the majority of my life, competitive sports in many different uh, arenas. I was always very curious. You know, I was the type of kid that would wander off places and explore places and test things and try things. Uh, That includes testing limits, you know, on my (laughs) on my parents and, you know, <laughs> on teachers and educators and, you know, anyone around me in, in a position of authority in many ways. And so, you know, that certainly led to a childhood filled with, uh, um, you know, a lot of pushback by people in positions of authority. I've always been the type of person that I guess in one way or another, even without directly doing so, was constantly asking the question why. And, um, you know, in, 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 in the majority of our societies, when we're younger, we're we're not actually uh, put in many positions where asking the question why is acceptable. It's just do what is supposed to be done because that's what you're supposed to do. And I had always been someone that would always ask why, you know. So it, 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 whether it's something trivial or something much more important than that, um, on a bigger scale, like why are we here, or trivial, like why do we do this that way? Um, you know, I've always been that, that person as a child. And I think that has a lot to do with, you know, growing up into an, being an entrepreneur because it's always been very hard for me to accept the status quo as the best possible solution for something. And that comes from my, my innate uh, need to say, well, why are we doing it that way? Which often leads to ideas of, well, what if we could do it that way or this way? And that obviously leads to, you know, a lot of creative endeavors. Yeah, absolutely. Something you said just then really deeply resonated with me. And it was the bit which you mentioned about doing what you're supposed to do. As creatives, as entrepreneurs, I think that something that we are natural at is being rebellious in a good way and challenging the way things are being done. I always believe you never forget a great teacher. And I was wondering who might have been the key figures around you growing up. Who who were the key characters that inspired you and have shaped you to become the person you are today? Well, that's, you know, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, without question, my mother. So I grew up with a single mother. Um, you know, my mother and my father divorced when I was five. I have only seen my father one time since then. We don't have a relationship together. Um, so in large part, my mother was that force in my life that um, through less through um, teaching and more through just her overall action actions herself has been a great uh, inspiration to me on uh, all the things that I think it takes to really be a great entrepreneur or just, you know, do the things you want to do with your life um, from the standpoint of, you know, hard work, dedication, resilience, grit, all the things that you can't, all the skills you can't necessarily learn in a book or without serious practice. I was able to just observe her going through those things, being a single mother, raising three children on her own, um, you know, in different jobs that she had and different, uh, you know, and, and eventually she was able to, uh, provide a great life for us by the time I was, um, in my late teens. Uh, and I, and I saw what a struggle it was from, you know, from being a little kid. So I think I learned a tremendous amount from her just by osmosis I think that I I also learned a lot from several of my coaches in different uh, uh, athletics, Um, although I think I learned a lot of things about how I didn't want to be as well um, through that, because there's there's this idea that, um, 
you know, as somebody who's been an ambitious person as a child, I saw people and was taught by people around me what it takes to be ambitious and, and um, in large part to achieve a lot of success, there's a lot of sacrifice that must be made. But in the wake of that sacrifice, if not done in an appropriate way, can also leave a lot of damage to other people. And so um, I've had to learn, you know, in early stages of my life, learn that ambition is not the result of, of competition and tearing others down as you build yourself up. Um, and, and that there's actually a better way to do that, which I didn't learn until I was an adult. Um, so I learned a lot of great things from a lot of my coaches, but I also learned a lot of behaviors that, um, that I actually ended up uh, wanting to change about myself as I got older. And then finally, I would say that, um, you know, not as a kid, but when I, when I got to my teens, my late teens, um, I, I met a couple who I actually worked for, uh, my first real significant job. And uh, they kind of took me under, my, under their wing as parent figures. And they taught me very practical things of just how to behave in the world um, you know, as a civilized member of society. And, and, um, and then also they taught me a lot about business and how to carry myself and how to make good decisions and uh, you know, make good choices. And, and uh, they were hugely influential on me. Clearly your mom was a, a key figure with you growing up. What would you say was one of the most significant characteristics or traits or attributes, if you like, that you picked up from your mum that you still very much carry with you through everything you do today? Resilience, without question, resilience. It, you know, especially today, you know, we live in such an uncertain world. And I talk to people about this all the time that when you, when you live when you live in a world in which the things around you seem uncertain, the reality is you have very little control over most things that go on in the world. However, um, we, we as humans like to create structures in which we have as much control as possible. You know, our living situations, our jobs, um, our income streams, our relationships. We try to build them as such so that there's some control and some level of certainty. But the reality is, is that in, in today's world, with the changing of technology and just the cultural shifts and the fact that we're globally connected now um, in ways we've never been before, uncertainty has increased in our life overall. And so one of the most important ways to navigate uncertainty is to really develop the skill of resiliency. Because resiliency means that you get to start over cons all the time, anytime, and not feel completely overwhelmed by that and not be taken down by that and not be put in a place where you don't think there's other opportunities out there available to you. And that's what I've seen a lot of in recent years. And that's the thing that I carry with my mom where I watched her just continuously be resilient in the face of very difficult, uncertain circumstances. And as a human being, that's a trait that cannot, that's immeasurable, your, your capacity to continuously rebound is immeasurable. Yeah, I really like that. You mentioned there about not being put in a place where you feel there aren't other opportunities available to you. I'd like to explore that a little bit more deeply with a real world scenario. So if we could imagine that this is a true scenario, I have a regular office job whilst I enjoy what I do and whilst I like who I work with and enjoy the salary I receive each month, I have a sense I want to pursue a more creative career. I really enjoy photography outside of work and I wonder if there's an opportunity to create a more fulfilling career doing something I am more passionate about, but I can't yet see the opportunities and I don't know where to begin. What could I be doing whilst I have a job to help prepare myself for a potential leap, for example? My advice may be a bit unconventional compared to most people um, who are in my position may answer this question. And I would say, first of all, all advice is anecdotal. So any direct advice that I give is based on my personal experiences for the most part, which are very different than your personal experiences. So that always has to be taken into consideration when somebody's even giving advice. But the first thing I would say to you is, are you sure? Are you sure you want to pursue a different career path? Are you sure that this isn't just the result of you seeing other people around you and possibly feeling envy or possibly feeling other feelings that aren't, aren't really you being unfulfilled, 
but you're only feeling unfulfilled because you're measuring yourself against other people or other things. So actually what you have may be ideal and you're thinking that something else is better when it might not actually be better because you're making comparisons that aren't true comparisons. So that'd be the first thing I would do. And then the second thing is, is that if I really did believe that despite the fact that I'm in a position where I'm comfortable, um, I'm still uh, unfulfilled, uh, then, then what I would do is I would, um, I would consider, I wouldn't necessarily just consider exploring my hobbies. So I'm a big believer that if you're trying to make a career out of something, you have to be solving problems. And so if you're trying to make money from something, you have to be solving problems in some capacity for people. And so I don't think it's as simple as I like photography and I'm passionate about it. Therefore, I should jump off the cliff and start a business around photography. I think that instead what you have to be able to do is you have to be able to say, what problem would I solve with photography in a big enough way, in a scalable enough way that I can actually make a career out of that? And then I would be asking, how good am I at that? Do I really have the skill to do that? And if not, what is it going to take for me to develop that skill? So the two things that I see that entrepreneurs do when they first start out and they take that leap that I think are detrimental to their growth is they take a leap into something where they're not actually solving a problem. They just like doing what they're doing. And I don't think that's a bit a good business decision. So it's not a good business decision to start becoming a photographer that's trying to make money just because you like taking photos. That's not a good business decision. The second thing that I see is that they anticipate and expect that by taking the leap and following their passion, that they will see results from that, even if they are solving a problem, that they will see results from that right away, when in fact it's likely that they aren't that good at it yet. And that while it's going to take some time to get good or get to the level that you're good enough to be paid well enough to be doing that thing. And we live in such a society you know, nowadays where we want instant gratification most of the time that we've lost sight of the idea that the people who actually do really well are deeply skilled at what they do. And in order to become deeply skilled, it doesn't mean you need to put in time necessarily, but you certainly have to be able to put in enough time and enough effort and become excellent at what you do in order to actually expect to be paid any sort of reasonable amount consistently for that work. And I think that that's often overlooked. Instead, we focus on more of the superficial I'm just simply passionate about this thing. I'm unfulfilled in what I'm currently doing. I think this will make me more fulfilled. Instead of looking at what is the business problem that we're solving and how skilled am I actually at solving that? And what is it going to take to, to accomplish both of those outcomes? That's a fascinating answer. Thanks, Greg. What I learned from that is being an entrepreneur, as we discussed earlier, is very much about joining dots and solving problems it's through our ability to solve problems that we add value to the world mm -hmm. and, and i can fully understand and appreciate how it may look attractive because people who solve problems remarkably well may have been doing that for many many years they make it look easy that's right Actually, and I can speak from my own experience here, it was much, much harder than, than, than trying to hold down a regular job. If I were to be in that position, if I was somebody that was in that position right now, what could I draw from my current circumstances or what could I be doing to test the waters and see what might be a good opportunity for me to further explore in terms of solving problems and adding value to the world as an entrepreneur? Well, so let's, let's stick with the photographer example. Um, <clears throat> since we're running with that. So some things to consider would be how do you measure up you know, to other photographers out there? Do you think you are one of the best photographers out there in whatever, you know, if you're doing landscape photography or portrait photography or whatever it might be, do you, do you think that you're at that level of, of the people who are doing this and making a great living at it? If not, well, then you need to practice or do whatever, you know, take, take, 
lessons, practice, do whatever the things are that have to be done to reach that level of skill. So that's one thing. The second thing is I am a big believer in little bets, you know, making little bets or doing little experiments to test the waters. And so, um, you know, one way that you know is to put stuff out there, even in a capacity in which you're not selling it, um, but just to see what people think of it, um, just to think if, uh, just to see if, if you're gaining any traction with it, um, is always a good idea. Because the reality is, is that if you are skilled at something, then people will come to you much more than you need to go to them. Because you will build up enough, um, uh, career capital in, in the terms, uh, uh, we could use the term career capital as a way of looking at that, where you will have enough capital built up where people will come to you for things. If they see you out there doing those things, it's kind of like the example I give is that say you're somebody, say you're a mother who bakes a birthday cake for your son or daughter, you take it over to the party and other mothers say to you, wow, that's an awesome cake you built, uh, baked. Could you bake one for my child's birthday party? And so say you bake another cake and you take it to that party and somebody's like, wow, that's an awesome cake you built. Will you do one for me? So the demand will always be there if you are skilled and great at something. So if you have to manufacture the demand, you're likely not as skilled or great as it as you think you are, and you're likely not putting enough work out there to see and to test the waters. So if I'm a baker and I put out a few cakes at, at kids' birthday parties and it starts happening where everyone wants a cake, well, then I know I'm onto something. Right. Same thing with photography. If I were to put portraits out there and people seem to be coming to me saying, hey, can you take my photo or, hey, I love those photos that you've been taking. I want to put one up in my house. Then, you know, you're on to something. And so the demand should always be there if you're solving a problem or if you're very skilled at something. So if you have to try to manufacture that demand all the time, then you know you're not quite there yet. And you know you need to be working on your craft more than anything else. So test those waters, see if any demand is there. And while you're doing that, become more skilled at what you're doing. That's fantastic, Greg. In your experience, how long do you give it until you know that you're heading in the right direction? And I appreciate that might be quite a generic question. And it would yeah. vary from scenario to scenario but what's the criteria that you personally apply how long do you give it before you know you're going in the right direction with something yeah so that that does definitely vary depending on the a bunch of scenarios that, that go into play there but i'll give you a, a kind of a couple of different ones that might uh be helpful so for me personally if i think i'm building something that is truly impactful and that is something if i were to die and I didn't go after that, or I didn't build that, and I would feel that my life was incomplete, then I will go after that thing for however long it takes. So there is no time limit. It's just however long it takes. If I'm doing something in which I could legitimately die and be okay that I didn't go after it, but it's a good idea, or it's something that seems interesting to me, or I'd like to explore it, then what I'll do is I'll, I'll put some sort of constraints around that. So I will give it not necessarily a time, but I will typically give it an emotional investment. So for me, it's much more about the emotional investment than it is the dollars or the time commitment to it. So if I find that I'm still enjoying it, and if I find that I can res be resilient and bounce back up from the negative things that are happening from it, if I find that that's happening, then I'll keep doing it. So I don't measure it based on external things like how many people purchased it from me, this product for me, or how many people hired me, or how many people came to my blog, or those types of external things to judge how much longer I'm going to do it. I judge it by its emotional impact on me. So if the emotional toll is something that I'm managing, or even something that I'm enjoying, I don't really care about those outside things because if those things are good and my idea is good enough and I'm developing my skill and I'm continuing to develop my skill, 
then eventually I'll get some results that I'm looking for. So I don't really base it on external results. I base it on me and how I feel. And if I still feel good about it and I'm still bouncing up, and now realize when I say I still feel good about it, I don't mean that every day is you know rosy and happy. I mean that I bounce back up and I still want to do it. Uh, then I'll keep doing it. You know, if I wake up the next day and I feel like, you know what, I'm regrouped. Let's try it again. You know, yesterday was a rough day, but today I'm back on my feet. Let's try it again. Then I'll keep doing it. And then at some point, if I get to the point where like, you know what, enough is enough. I just can't take the emotional toll anymore. Then what I do is I pause. I don't immediately quit. I just pause and I check in with people that I trust to find out if I'm just having a series of bad days or if I'm in just kind of like a depression hole or if truly it's time to do something else. And usually if I pause for a few days and I talk to people that I trust and have conversations with them honestly about where I'm at, coming out of that I will know that either, no, what, no, I'm still in this, I'm still going to be resilient, or I'll say, you know what, I think it is time to move on at that point. What I particularly like is that for somebody who is analytic, you're using quite a subjective measure there. It's about your emotional investment and how you're feeling emotionally towards or passionately, how much passion you're feeling towards a particular pursuit. You were talking about sacrifice earlier and I think it would be easy to assume that your success is linear and you have sort of ongoing (laughs) success after success, but I'm sure that's almost certainly not the case. Can you talk to me about some catastrophic situations or failures that you've had or significant times in your life where you've had to do that? Yes. Yeah. Well, well, without question, you know, I, I just believe that you just keep going until you finally figure things out in a lot of ways. And so I've had many business failures, you know, many. I think that, you know, the third business I started was a clothing apparel line. Um, I think we lasted like three months, Mm -hmm. maybe four months, you know, before we were out of business. I once lost $7 million in a real estate deal. I mean, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's that's, that's a lot of money. (laughs) That's a lot to let go of, yeah. Yeah. I've even, you know, built successful businesses and then struggled personally where, you know, I, you know, part of it was due to medical situation, but, you know, then ended up struggling personally where I ended up, you know, being $500,000 in debt and, um, you know, had major issues there, per, you know, with personal debt. Um, I've, I've even as recently as uh, two years ago started a company, an online learning platform that we barely got off the ground and then decided to close down. I tried to build two apps that never actually made it to market recently. Um, you know, so I, I have tons of those, like, you know, a graveyard of failures, some of which have been, you know, catastrophic, you know, in terms of dollar amounts and other things. And so that's why I believe so strongly in the, 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 what I would call the timeless skills, because in the end, the things that matter are creativity critical thinking, communication, resiliency, grit. Those are the skills that always get you through and get you to the next thing, get you to the next success, get you through the next failure. And, and, and so I spend the majority of my personal time working on those things when I'm, when I'm working. You know, I, I, I obviously have hobbies and other things where I'm just hanging out, but but when I'm working on myself, I, I spend considerable amount of time on what I would consider those timeless skills. And, and I do that because I know that as somebody who is going to try to problem solve, I'm going to fail a lot. And I don't like failure. I don't want failure. I don't celebrate failure. I don't think it's a good idea to fail. But I certainly understand that it does happen. So all that matters is, is how you rebound from that. And so for me, it's not so much trying to be successful at every idea I have. For me, it's trying to legitimately problem solve and know that in an effort to problem solve, you will without a doubt come up with bad ideas. You will without a doubt execute poorly. You will without a doubt not follow through. 
And so, you know, you just know that going in, or I know that going into different ideas. And so some work and some don't. The thing is, is that you, you, you have this balance between it. You wouldn't just talk to me if all I did was just sit here and talk about my failures. Right. So talk to me because I've been successful as well. So if, if, if I were going to do an interview or write a book or something like that, it would be, it would behoove us all for me to provide you with inspiration and ideas about how you can move forward. Um, and so what happens in that process is, is we lose sight of the fact that actually anybody that's done anything of any level of significance most likely has not only been successful or just moved from one success to the next. There's been a lot of bumpy road along the way. We just don't talk near enough about that as maybe we should. Well, I'm glad we've at least skimmed the surface. You talk about success and inspiration there. And I'd like to ask you shortly before we close up, Greg, what's been the most inspiring experience you've had recently, perhaps in the last week or so? Ooh, that's a good question. We should have we should always have answers to this question right off the top of our head because we should be <laughs> surrounded by such inspiration, right? Right. Um, I don't know in the last week or so, but I will say that um, it's very inspiring to me. I, I, I serve as an entrepreneur in residence at, for a, an organization called Starbucks. And so we have a location where I work out of probably three times a week. And while I'm there, I'm surrounded by entrepreneurs that are working on things all the time. Most of them first time entrepreneurs, most of them much younger than me. And so I'll tell you, it's, it's super inspirational to watch them, uh, watch the lights go off in their head and in their eyes when they figured things out, you know, and, and things that they've been working on for a long time. And so that's super inspirational to me just to watch that unfold and see where uh, those connections happen for them. And when I can just even be a you know, small sliver of, of watching that happen or be a part of that for them is truly inspiring to me. But I will say that one thing that happened to me recently was as I um, – so was sitting next to a guy, this didn't happen in the last couple of weeks, but it wasn't that long ago, where I was sitting next to a guy at the beach. We were both staring at the ocean. This was a beach that I actually had a home on. I used to live on this beach and, uh, a few years ago. And so I was sitting next to him and he was just crying, just bawling. And he was probably um, in his 70s. And, um, you know, I asked him at one point, I got really uncomfortable. You know, I was like sitting next to this guy crying and, and it made me really uncomfortable. And, and so I asked him, I said, uh, you know, sir, is there anything I can help you with? And he said, no. And we started talking, though. And he said, he said, this is the first time I've ever seen the ocean. Wow. And he said, uh, my wife just died. And and I had made a I had made a commitment to her. We had made a commitment to each other that we would go see the ocean, and we didn't get a chance to go see it together. So I made the commitment that I would go anyway. And so this was a gentleman that was in his seventies. This is the first time he'd ever seen the ocean, and I lived on the ocean, you know. And so I'm staring at this magnificent ocean and these waves and the sunset, and I'm taking it obviously for gr for granted because I've experienced it before. And here's a gentleman in his 70s who had never experienced that before, who was so awe-inspiring to him that he was actually crying over this experience. Yeah. And, and it was a great reminder to me that, um, you know, I, I did a project where I traveled around the country for three years, around the U.S. for three years, and I visited all 50 states. Yeah. And the one question, the one thing that I would say to myself everywhere I went is I would say, it's likely you are never going to be here again what would you do if you were never going to be here again? And so I had so many amazing experiences by just asking myself that question. What would I do if I were never going to be here again? And what carried over for me with that was as much like being in this spot with this gentleman where he didn't really get those opportunities. I wasn't going to let those opportunities pass. So now I do that in my everyday life. So when I, in my everyday life, and I'm at places that I go to all the time, I like to ask myself, what if I were never going to be here again? What would I do? 
Is there something I would say to somebody? Is there something crazy I would do? Is there something different I would do? Something different I would order from the menu? Whatever it might be. And it's just allowed me to live a much more rich, fulfilled life, I think, by just simply asking that question, even in the most ordinary of circumstances or places. What would you do if you were never here again? Yeah, that's a pretty moving story about the gentleman at the beach there. And I have to say, if we lived our lives by that particular question, I got a feeling we'd probably be grateful for a lot more and would probably notice a lot more. And we may even behave slightly more powerful ways, I imagine. Greg, I'm certainly incredibly grateful for your time today. Before we finish up, I'd like to just quickly ask you what you're grateful for. Oh, geez, that list is impossible. I mean, we'd be here. We'd be here all day, Rob. But, you know, I think in, in general, I'm just I'm just honestly, I'm, I'm grateful for the fact that I've been put in a place where I can legitimately make an impact on people's lives in a very practical way and do it in a way that is fulfilling to me. So I get to be fulfilled out of that. They get to be fulfilled out of that. And I've been fortunate to be put in that position multiple times over. And uh, that's very rewarding. You know, it's, it's very rewarding to have that experience on a consistent basis. You mentioned Starvups earlier. Uh, what projects are you working on right now? And where can I find out more about you and your work? It's always easiest to go to greghartle.com, uh, H-A-R-T as in Tom, L-E, greghartle.com. That's usually where I have things, although I'm not particularly great at updating it or keeping mm-hmm. it up. Uh, however, um, you know, right now I'm working on a product that's coming out soon called Site Builder, which uh, allows people to build their own websites and control their own web presences with very little technical savvy or ability, um, for, especially for small business owners, especially for location businesses, not necessarily online businesses. Um, that's a big project that I'm working on. This, uh, another big project that I'm working on is um, helping startups take their model nationally around the United States so that we have a better success rate with entrepreneurs. One of the things that I'm most passionate about is this idea that 90% of businesses fail within the first five years. I would like to be a part of a solution, you know, talk about problem solving, where that percentage rate is much lower and the success rate is much higher. So I'm working on ways in which I can do that. And then in addition to that, quite honestly, you know, having just come off of spent three straight years, 1,068 straight days on the road, um, I'm resting. (laughs) More than anything else, I'm I'm just taking a break and resting in many ways, and it feels uh, marvelous. Great stuff. Well, thank you for spending your resting time with me, um, Greg, and talking to me today. Of course. Um, you truly, for me, you truly are an inspirational creative, and it's 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 an amazing experience to get this far and to have you on the very first episode. So thanks for that. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Rob. Thanks for listening. Nothing beats the stories and advice of an expert to help you raise your creative game. I would love to know what you thought about today's episode, so don't forget to subscribe in iTunes where you can rate and review the show. Your review is the best way for other people to find us. I might even give you a mention. If you like this episode, I invite you to share it on Facebook or Twitter with the one person you know who will benefit from the wisdom shared here today. You can find the show notes on inspirationalcreatives.com forward slash podcast. If you have a burning question or a great idea for a guest, head on over to inspirationalcreatives.com forward slash contact where you can connect with me there. Join me in episode two where I review some actions from today and join me with Pam Slim next week in episode three where we discuss the art of storytelling and creating your body of work.